when I was walking uh, from home today, I don't live too far from here, a number of people offered me tickets. And I said, no, no, I don't need a ticket, I'm a speaker. And then I realized they were not talking about this, they were talking about the <laughs> football game. Anyway, the, uh, I used to run a series of talks like this, sort of for a general audience, and, and I have a lot of sympathy for the organizer because I remember the, the worry that I had every single time, nobody will show up. So I'm happy that you got, you didn't want to walk all the way up to the hill, so you decided to stop here instead of going and watching the game. The, so le let me tell you a little bit how I got involved into this kind of thing. I mean, he gave me a call someday and said, somebody mentioned your name. So what I, about 20, 20 something, 25 years ago, I was department chair in the math department. Uh, and Chancellor Tien, I don't know, maybe some of the older people may even remember him. He was a fantastic chancellor. He was worried about the fact that you come as a student to Berkeley and suddenly you're thrown into these classes with 500 students. I know that very well. I teach one on Tuesday and Thursday. You're welcome to come. We're still in the middle of the semester. So Tien thought maybe uh, we should have smaller groups where students uh, just meet sort of a semi-human being, meaning a faculty person, okay? And uh, every department was asked to contribute one such seminar, and I was the department chair, and I asked all my colleagues to do something. You can imagine what happened, nobody did think. So I was too embarrassed, and I proposed one to teach one myself. So I had to think of a name, and I call it the mathematics of gambling. And I've been doing this for, for quite a number of years, on and off. And let me tell you how it normally goes, because we will see the same thing here in a smaller scale. At the beginning of the semester, the students loved me, I think. At least they smile. They do all, all the proper things. And then, at the end, I get the worst possible evaluations of any single class that I teach. So you can wonder why on earth do I keep doing that. But let, let, that's another, that's for my psychologist to find out. The, I think the reason they hate me is after a while, they get tired of seeing all these strange things and they would like for all of us to go to Vegas and they would love to see me losing a lot of money in the real world. Since we don't do that, they write in the evaluation that I'm a cheat, I'm a liar, which is all true. But anyway, so I'm, we are not going to go to Vegas at the end. Let me just assure you of that. I'll show you some, something with cards at the very end. But the, 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 I do have a real point here, and we'll start with some concrete games pretty quickly. Uh, I heard all these interesting talks about real science, and I, when I was young, I wanted to be a physicist. Let me mention that. I don't really see a big difference between math and, and real science. Math is just the language of the sciences, period. So a lot of the things that are behind this so supposedly silly games is the same thought process that goes into designing complicated things like these medical imaging machines or anything like that. So there is, there is a lot of unity there. Okay, so and we're going to do a thought experiment first because if we do it in practice, it may take a little bit too much time. You mentioned that I have to stop at 4 p.m. Something like that? Okay, very good. The, so imagine that you take a coin out of your pocket. You don't have to really do this, okay? Take a regular coin, fair coin, 50-50, and you start tossing it. So it may go heads, heads, tails, tails. In that case, you stop. That is, you keep tossing till the number of heads that you get equals the number of tails that you get, okay? So you have to write down your outcomes. Yeah? You write heads. If you get head and tail, you stop right there and write the number two. Two is the number of times that you needed to toss before the two things equalize, okay? And somebody may need more time and so on. Clearly, the number of times that you need to toss has to be an even number, yeah? because otherwise you're not going to have a chance of getting back to zero for the total sum. So we are not going to do this just because it takes time, but assume that you do it. So I, I go buy another cup of coffee, which is illegal to have in this room, I'm sure anyway. Um, 
and come back in 20 minutes. What do you think will happen? Uh, will everybody be finished by then? What do you think is the average time that it takes a human being to get the two counts to equalize? I mean, some people will actually equalize in, in two steps, right? Head, tails, or head, tails is the same thing, right? Some people will take four, some people will take 12. I come back and I see these two guys in the corner there that are still tossing in, my in 20 minutes. And, and let's say you toss once every second. Right? Another reason for not doing the experiment here. What's, what's wrong with those two guys over there? Is there anything wrong? What do you think? What's the average? What, what do you expect to get for the time that it takes a person to, to equalize? Any, any thoughts? We're not, going, we're not doing anything for money here today. So you can say whatever you want. Okay? Hmm? Is it a fair coin? Is it a yes, it is a fair coin, which is, that's a very good question. A fair coin is something in your mind, because I'm sure any given coin is not really fair. Okay? But it's close, close to being fair. We'll talk about fair and unfair coins later. Yeah? 30, so meaning 30 times, more or less. Okay, that's, I, I've heard every possible answer, so no, nothing that I hear will shock me. Yes? Four seconds. Four seconds, you mean four, four, four times, okay, average. that's the average, okay. But notice the average doesn't have to be exactly 30. It could be 32.5, or who knows? I saw lots of other hands, yeah? Oh, well, that's what is happening to those two guys over there. Yeah, and my question is, is there anything strange? Yeah. It is a random probability, and this is a word, see, we're going to be talking randomness all the time, right? So yeah, what, what one calls, there is something called the expected value for a random variable, and that's technically what I'm talking about. But it is the average, and notice I'm not putting any limit Okay, well in practice, in 20 minutes, I'm coming back with my hot coffee. But, but in theory, we, I don't know, as you said, somebody could go for a eh, long, long trip. So, any, anybody, so I, the largest number that I heard was about 30. Anybody thinks 100 is a better answer than 30? Anyone thinks? Five minutes. Eh? Five minutes. I have to convert units. I mean, that's why I left physics. <laughs> <laughs> what are Six, 60, <laughs> okay. Well, le let me tell you what the answer is, and I hope you will not be too disappointed. The answer is actually larger than any number you can say. The expected value, technically speaking, is infinite, okay? So there is nothing wrong with these two guys over there. There is something wrong with the rest of you, if there is something wrong, okay? Yeah? If I can sample of like a hundred people doing this, yeah? there is a reason why you have Well, for a hundred, uh, Sure. I'm, I'm assuming, see, we are getting technical, which I don't really want to do. I'm assuming that I have an infinite population and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, we can talk some more. But the expected value, if it makes sense to compute, is infinite. Okay, let me show you uh, one or two things. I, I'm not sure that I will put all of them in here. Uh, there is a... Uh, I'm going to assume, first of all, I have to make sure that I'm alive at the end of the hour by not falling here. So can people see from the back what I have here? Yeah? So imagine I'm, I have here three wheels, and I'm going to assume that these are, say, roulette wheels. Hmm? So this is spun around, and then it goes around for a while, and it can stop in any one of these three positions. Either the seven is down, or the five is down, or the three is down. Is that okay? And I pay attention to the number in the bottom. All right? And now we can do the. You come in, and you pick one of the wheels. See, you're sitting in the wrong spot. Pick, pick one. Okay. You pick A. You pick A. You pick A. Okay. Um, all right, fine. Uh, so he spins, and then he gets one of the three numbers, either three, a five, or a seven, okay? This is, a, again, this is an ideal roulette. Everything has 
probability one third in this case. Eh? It's a fair roulette. And I pick, for instance, uh, B, say. Okay? If I pick B, I have the three numbers, same story. And say he gets a seven, I get a four, the, the larger number wins. Okay? But it could have gone some other way. He could have gotten this answer and I could have gotten nine, right? In which case I win. And we keep playing. The randomness that was mentioned earlier is very crucial here. If you're going to play just once, well, that's fine. But let's assume that we keep playing the whole night. He stays with A all the time. I play with B all the time. And each one of the three numbers that Steve has has one third probability. Same story for me. Well, if you compute, it's not too hard in this case to actually lay down all possible cases. Incidentally, this is a very different game from the first one. In the first one, there was an infinite horizon in time. I wasn't putting any limit. Whereas here, there are only three possibilities in each coin, eh? each wheel. You can list them all, and you can conclude rather well that on average, hmm, Steve will make money out of me. I wrote here A greater than B just to indicate that A beats B. Okay? Very good. So he was, uh, he was mad in choosing A. Now, let me just tell you what happens. If he had, say, chosen B and I had chosen C, Mm? Repeat the whole same story again. The numbers, there are nine numbers and they have been distributed properly. On average, B beats C. Okay? So if I wanted to lose money, remember you came here just to learn how to lose your money. So that's, that's all that I... Oh, I should actually go back before any lawyer jumps from the audience. What I teach my students in the gambling seminar is not to gamble. Okay? I mean, the, the, the main point of the class is to show them every single game in every single casino, you're going to lose money. So the only thing that we do is we analyze how fast you're going to lose your money. And if you want to spend, some people uh, have a lot of fun just being in the casino, and you may want to stretch your money for a longer time, but you're guaranteed to lose. So I, I'm not here corrupting minors, okay? If I knew how to win, I wouldn't be teaching it. <laughs> okay, we'll come to that story later. Okay, so now, this is what happens. A beats B. You can sit down later and do, do the computation. Eh? There are a total of, uh, there are three possible outcomes here, there are three possible outcomes there. If you think for a moment, there are nine outcomes all together when you look at the outcomes from these two wheels, right? He could get a five, and me a four, so that's one, and you keep doing three times three is nine, you get nine. It turns out that of the nine possible outcomes, he is ahead of me five times, I'm ahead four times. So on average, if we keep playing the whole night, he will make money. By the same token, B beats C, okay? So if he, he's the organizer of the thing, so he knows everything, you may think. If he has chosen A, do I have any anything smart that I can do? Let me tell you. Yeah. What if you try doubling your bet every time? Yeah, no, we, we won't do that. No, every, this is a very good question. This is a very good question. And this is where the casino really gets you because then you start, yeah. Now here, I'm, I'm not going to change the rules, okay? Yeah. Can I do something here? Uh, so believe me, or just count, that A beats B and that B beats C. Any sensible human being concludes that A beats C, and you're wrong. What I should have done when he chose A was to choose C. This should fly against your intuition. I mean, I don't know why one thinks that if A beats B and B beats C, A has to beat C. Well, it just ain't true in this case. And, and careful, and I'm not saying all the billions of human experience collected in what we call common sense is wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there are always some exceptions, and, and that's really what the talk is all about, okay? The numbers have been chosen very carefully. Somebody may be computing already very fast. 
of the nine possible outcomes when you compare A and C, turns out that C beats A five times out of nine. Not obvious, but true, okay? I'll hide this, or it, well, maybe I'll leave it down. Another game, Another, and I'll, I'll show you a few of these. So most, I mean, this is really the point of my talk, and that's why the students initially love me, and then they hate me, okay? Because they say, well, if this guy is so smart, let's see how he does in the real world. Well, I don't get involved with the real world. That's, that's the way to do it. Okay, so here is, uh, the numbers are different. Eh? Don't, don't, if you notice some differences, that's on purpose. And mind you, the numbers have been chosen very, very carefully, okay? I am not saying at all that every time that A beats B and B beats C, C will beat A. I mean, if this were the case, Galaxies wouldn't be around, no, nothing would work, okay? Assuming that you have a random model for that. But sometimes, if you fiddle with some parameters, you may get some, some shock. Okay. So here is a, a game that is played in a different way. I'm the, the house, okay? Again, roulette. This is not done with roulette. If you ever go to the science uh, museum in Paris, they have these wheels mounted in there. They are electronic, but they are standing up. You, don't, you won't see any, any roulette. But let's assume they are roulettes. My eight is a little bit funny, but that's an eight. So we, we will play the following thing. I'm the house, OK? And you come in, and I say, well, I am C, all right? And you have to choose either A or B. Let's, I'm going to dictate that you choose A, and she chooses, I mean, first, slow. Two, two at a time, let's go slow. So there is a two-person game, okay? I only allow one opponent. I stick to C, and you are A, say, and we play, and again, the same silly computation of here shows that when you confront A and C, A beats C five out of nine times. Yeah, where a C beats A four out of nine times. So if you have to choose, it's better not to be the house. Okay? Is that clear? All right. But this gentleman there may have picked that one here. In that case, let me tell you that the same thing happens. So A beats C. You have to sit down and do it. All, all the data you need is just take the numbers and then you, you can figure it out. It is also true that B beats C. Again, this is a two-person game. Right? The house against whoever comes. So these people will take my money for a while, and they will be very happy. And by now, there is a whole crowd around there, OK? We'll pass drinks or whatever they pass in the casino and so on. And then I say, OK, fine. Now that there are enough people, let's play three people. I'm still the house, huh? but I play against both him and her at the same time. So your choice was A, my choice was B, uh, her choice was B, I'm still C. So we now throw, there are three numbers. If you want to do the count, careful. How many outcomes are there for such a game? There are 27 now. Before there were just nine, because nine is three times three. When we were playing two people at a time, there are nine possible outcomes for the game. Now there are 27, so it takes a little bit longer to compute. It's is it a good idea for the house to play now? The house lost both against him and against her. And now if you sit down and do it, you will see now the house beats you. Again, a little bit shocking. You will assume that if you have two games of this kind, huh, and C lost against this person and against that person, when we change the rules just a little bit, the rules are now that there are three players, and the top number is the one that wins. Notice the numbers are all different, so there are never any matches here. Yeah? Then C actually beats the combination of, of all of them. Another one like that. Okay. What is nice about these is essentially all that you have to do is don't, don't believe anything that I say. Yeah? I'm, I'm, I'm a great liar. Not today. Once, once a week, I don't lie. Uh, just do it yourselves. Just count and see, okay? 
And in these two cases, this can be analyzed. Later on, I'll come back to your question about fair coins. I will describe another game which, uh, <coughs> well, you have to take my word or I'll send you to the web to see for the details. But this one you could in principle do in the back of a small envelope. Any, any questions so far? Please, yes. A, B. No, I, I'm, I'm not comparing. I, I don't know. I mean, one, one can do it. No, but I'm always playing A against C or B against C. But you're not playing A against No, no. I'm the house, and you come in, and you pick one of the other two roulettes, and you play against me, and in the long term, you beat me. Somebody else comes. And now this person, or maybe even yourself, could have picked B, but it's again B against C. Okay? So this is just a two-person game with me being the house always. Okay? And then at some point I change the game, and you will, I think most humans will go for this without even a question, right? And they will wonder what's wrong with the, the house that is willing to lose twice as much money. The fact is now the house, the house will win. You have to go to another casino. We don't play that game. No, I'm, I'm out to steal your money. I, I would have to consult with my management, which is checking from the ceiling. <laughs> I don't know. You may, yeah. No, you, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get through a, a collection of games. Yeah. Game one, this, the game one, let me tell you now the way that it is played. You come in, this is always played two people at a time. The point of this game, so I'm not changing any rules. The point is, you choose your wheel first, and then I choose after you, and I always beat you. That's a summary, see I didn't tell it in that way. Thank you for the question, okay? See the point is, when you choose, there is always a way for me to choose that will beat you. And that's rather, it's the same thing. I'm not changing anything, but it's another way of telling the same story. Exactly. Yeah. The, the reason. Hmm? It's like rock, paper, scissors. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in a place where that game was not that popular. But yeah. Did you ever calculate if the house was seeking that you get I don't. I, I don't remember if I did. I, I don't want, I mean, I will try to keep the, my lies to a minimum, hopefully zero, okay? Let me tell you, show you another one. I want to say, so I have the three here. This will take a, a moment. And then I have the one about the unfair coins. And then I want to show you the importance of counting cards, which is, some of you may have, we'll talk about blackjack and, 21 and stuff like that. In fact, we won't talk about that at all, but some of you will remember that. Okay, so let, I have chosen some numbers. I, I don't want to do the numbers while I'm talking and getting it all wrong. So let me explain how this works out. So initially, there are two containers, one and two. And this is my attempt to draw a top hat, cross section of a top hat. And I, I had asked my assistant to come today. With, we're going to kill some chicken while we're doing this, and smoke was going to come up, but he couldn't come. Never mind. So imagine you have a container that I call one. At the beginning, only think of one and two. And then later we'll think of this one. OK? So this is the numbers, again, have been picked rather carefully, okay? So what I will do in container one, I will throw in a total of 1,500 balls, of which 500 are white and uh, 1,000 are black, okay? That's what W1 and B1 stands for, okay? 
you can move the numbers a little bit. So here there is going to be a mixture. I will then shake this and I will grab one, one of these balls at random without cheating. Okay. And I will compare. So what's the probability of getting a white ball here? I mean, we can do the math, right? Is the number of favorable cases, which is 500, divided by the total number of cases, which is 1,500, so that's one third. This is the last fraction that I compute in public, okay? <laughs> so the chances of getting a white ball here, let's say, is, is one third. E everyone agrees with that? And of course, I'm sure if you do it just once, or, or if you do it 10 times and you compute, it may not be exactly one third. So we are talking again sort of ideal, okay? Whereas here, I have a mixture and I have put in here 40 white balls and 100 black balls, okay? So what is the chance of getting on the, on the right side a white ball if I draw at random? Well, same rule. Okay, and, and you can go back and ask, I mean, I'm sure real gamblers do ask, why, why do we believe in that rule? Well, you don't have to believe in this rule. You can make up your own. If you don't like my rule, my rule says that the chances of, of getting a white here is 40 out of 140. Is that right? Is that okay? I think uh, you can, I mean, this is more a philosophy or a human psychology question. Why do we believe in that rule? Another lecture, some other day. We need more beer for that. <laughs> uh, people were selling me beer on the way here all the time. Uh, early in the morning. Okay, so where do you think the chances of getting the white are larger? On the left or on the right? That's the, the entire experiment. Yeah? Um, left. On the left, right? And, and I, can, I agree with you because this number is exactly a half of the other number. Right? The numbers you should divide is these divided by the sum of the two. But this is one half, and this is less than a half of the other number. So we're not going to write any numbers, but I think most people here would agree that the chance of getting a white here is larger than that of getting a white here. Is that okay? I, I, I don't know how to argue any, anything else. All right. The next one... <coughs> Uh, I pick the numbers like this. The now, forget about this. This is off. I'll cover it. Great. We can do that. Uh, now here, a new experiment. Eh? Uh, top half number three and top half number four. We have this mixture. 70 white, uh, 60 uh, black balls here, and some other proportion here. Uh, same rule, nothing has changed. This has no connection whatsoever with the previous one. The previous one is gone, you do that on some other day or in some other room, nobody is talking on the phone, no, no cheating. Where is the chance of getting a white ball larger, on the left or on the right? I think we all agree, right? I mean, this is exactly the same number, so here the chances of getting a white or a black, for that matter, ball, is one half, whereas here is a little bit larger, okay? Very good. So now we are going to end with the following thing. I take these two top hats, and what I do is, remember, here I had 1,500 balls, here I had, whatever, 130 balls. I combine these two guys into these or, or I simply pour these contents in there, whatever. Take, take another set of top hats and drop in here everything that was on the left side. All the whites and blacks here and there are all dropped in here. Likewise over here. Everything that was here and there is dropped in there, okay? Before you start computing anything, what is the chance of getting a white ball larger? Here, right? Go home and compute. It ain't true. See, common sense tells you that I'm just wasting your time, right? 
chances of getting it right was larger here than there, larger here than there. So, of course, when you combine, it should be larger here than there, but it ain't. Okay? Once again, the numbers have been chosen carefully. Okay? So, this is a little bit, it's in the same spirit as these other two. Okay? All, all that you need is to add up the numbers and do the fractions, you see. Some of you may be involved in teaching at some level. If fractions, if the sum of two fractions were, as some of my, even my students in college would like it to be sometime, the sum of the, the numerators divided by the sum of the denominators, then your conclusion would be correct. But you don't sum them like that. Yes? Yeah, my math isn't very good, but when I look at number two, okay. Three point five for. Yeah, forty divided by. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I was looking here. Yeah, that one over there. Uh huh. Right would be three point five, whereas mm -hmm. the other one would be three point three. So, what are your chances be improved with two rather than one? You, you may be right. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm, I'm simply saying this is the way I play my game. I have the pair one, two and the pair 3, 5, oh, gotcha. in each case, it was more likely for me to get a white ball on the left than on the right. That and was... The chances in number one on the left, mm -hmm. there would be a one-third chance of getting a white ball. Here? Yeah. Mm, here is one-third. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And then the next one yeah. is, is... It four. looks like it's a, a 3 point well, it's, it's 4 divided by 10. 4 divided by 10. Point 0.4. Exactly. Uh, well, no, no, no. I, I, I did the, the obvious mistake. Yeah, very good. It's 4 divided by 104. That's too difficult for me to do in my head. But whatever it is, the fraction here is smaller than the fraction there. The probability of getting a white is like that. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the numbers here. If we have time at the I'm, I'm per, I have it all written down there. Believe me that I did my homework. But... Uh, I want, you see, now we are starting to move in the stage where my class starts hating me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I didn't plan him. <laughs> okay. Now I want to tell you uh, of another game. This actually illustrates my, the point that I tried to make rather poorly, I'm sure, earlier, very, very, very well. So I'm going to give credit to, I mean, this is a, a, the first one that you cannot do in your head. Unless you come to my class on Tuesday, Tuesday I teach this semester, I didn't call it the mathematics of gambling because people were so mad with me, so I call it random walks, but it's all the same thing, okay? So I'm going to explain the next one in my seminar, freshman seminar, bath 24, 11 a.m., room 939 Evans. So let, let me give you the name. This is a friend of mine, Jose Parrondo. This is a, an honest physicist from Madrid, Spain. And Parrondo was not playing these foolish games. Um, he was actually, to be absolutely honest, if, by, by the way, before I forget, if you go into Google, and some of these modern people have Google already in their finger, put the word Parrondo's paradox, and you are going to get lots of pages talking just about what I'm going to talk about. Okay? What you don't see in any of those pages, and you will not see today, is the explanation behind the paradox. I mean, that, that takes a little bit long. So Parrondo was trying to understand a page in the famous lecture notes of Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman passed away, unfortunately, quite a number of years ago, now that I think. Scary more than 20 years ago, 30 years, something like that, was a fantastic American physicist, born in New York, raised in New York. If you talk to him, you, you could not fail to notice that. And he was a professor at Caltech, and he wrote these famous Feynman lecture notes in physics that used to be the standard book in physics in, in the 60s. Then it was, of course, considered to be too difficult. Uh, they were difficult already back then. Anyway, Parrondo was trying to understand a particular lecture in Feynman, 
And Feynman says something or other, this has to do with thermodynamics, a very difficult subject for everyone. What happens if you combine two machines and try to get work out of them? Each one does something separately. What happens if I put them together? If you think for a moment, you may notice some similarities here. And here I'm putting two things together, okay? Actually, I'm very proud that I told Parondo that I saw the analogy. He had not seen it. Um, so Parondo wrote a paper in a physics journal. I'm sure this is mentioned in the, in the web analyzing this result of Feynman and saying, well, even Feynman could be wrong occasionally. I'm not going to get into that, but you find that if you, if you don't find it on your own, send right to me, I'll tell you where to look. Eventually, some people took away all the physics and made a little game with unfair coins. So that's what I want to tell you, and that's what you're going to find in the, in the, so I, I need to look a little bit here. So this is the way that the, the Parondo game is played. Okay, and this will take a few minutes to explain properly. So I'm going to go to, I have to pick on someone, you. Okay, and he will get involved very soon. On Monday, I go uh, to your house and we will play with a coin, but this is an unfair coin. So this is a coin that is 49% in your favor, let's say, and 51% in my favor. Or should we do it? Maybe let's, let's make it nicer. 51 for you, I just changed the rules, and this for me. So we'll play with the coin, okay? And we'll play again every millisecond if you want, and we we'll play from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next morning, okay? So it's a lot of uh, playing, and here is time. And this is your fortune. Well, st your fortune starts at zero, okay? And at time one, well, it can either go up or down. I have to explain. Uh, <coughs> remember, the coin is heads or tails, but uh, I win if it is heads, and heads has 49% probability, okay? You win if it is tails. So. Initially, your fortune will go maybe up to one or down to minus one, depending if you win or if you lose, right? And then after one, well, now it starts branching. Drawing this becomes very, very difficult. From one, it can go up to two, but it can go down to zero because you may lose. From minus one, it can go up to zero or down to minus two. The next time, well, depending. If you're here, it can go up there or down here. From here it can go there or down here. From here it can go there or down here. And, and it keeps going up and up and up, okay? So for instance here, this is important. So I'm plotting your fortune, just your fortune. So we may have followed, for instance, the path that goes straight like this. Let's say you're winning all the time, which is not so crazy after all because the coin favors you, right? So if you think for a moment, this may be the most likely of all paths after all. This is not, not so crazy. Somebody talked about a long run. Well, here you have a coin that is not fair. So this could happen. So I just want you to notice here, your fortune is three. Here it was two, one, zero. Down here would be minus one or minus two and so on, okay? Now, would you be interested in playing this game? I have to ask for your permission. This is not mandatory. Do you want to play this game? You don't want to play the game? Please say yes, you're going to ruin my story. <laughs> Come on, what's wrong with her? I don't know what school you go to, but you have 51% of play. You see, the, we have already crossed the point when they hate me. See, by now they don't trust anything that I say, okay? But this is still perfectly fine. Your fortune very likely will oscillate, if we look at a different scale, eh, from very far away, we we'll, may go negative, but everybody expects that there is going to be a drift in the positive direction, yeah? yeah because, and, and this is actually true. You can prove it mathematically. If you don't believe in math, do it, and, and, and this is what happens, okay? Nothing wrong with that. Now, on Wednesday, we have a more complicated game. This game 
is going to be played with one of two coins. Here there was just one coin, this silly coin that was more in head favor than in my favor, okay? So now on Wednesday, we have two different coins. One is biased in her favor. I have, if somebody cares, or you can look in the web, I have the actual number. I don't want to overburden you with numbers now. There is one coin that is in her favor and one coin that is biased in my favor, okay? And if somebody insists, I can go eventually and find the numbers. They are sitting there. I need to do that on Tuesday for my class. Okay, now, of course, I know what she wants. She wants to use always the coin that is biased in her favor, whereas I would like to use always the other coin, okay? And if we do that, then you don't need any math. If we use always her coin, she will win in the long run. At the beginning, there may be some oscillations, whereas uh, I would like to use the other coin so that I will win. So we need something smarter or more sophisticated. So we're going to do the following. Depending on the value of her fortune, initially her fortune was zero. The numbers I'm going to distinguish in two classes. Those that are multiples of three, like zero, or three, or six, or nine, or minus three, or minus six, or keep on going, minus 21, all that, all these numbers. At the very beginning, the fortune is zero, so we decide to use, let's say, this coin here, with whatever biases it has. But then we play with that coin, so her fortune either goes to one or to minus one. The next time I look, and see if the fortune is in this list. Of course it's not, because it's either one or minus one. So now we're going to use the other coin. And then we keep on going. So every time that we're going to play, before we decide which coin to use, we look at her fortune at that moment and decide. If it is in this list, we use one coin. If it is in the other list, we use the other coin, okay? The details are very, tricky to discuss here, but what happens in practice, and you can also prove mathematically, is that eventually she beats me once again. So on Monday, this is a typical path of her fortune, on Wednesday, this is a typical path. The paths are different, but they have this trend in both cases. I haven't given you enough details, and if I have time, I'll have one story to button out Wall Street in a moment, but that may have to wait, okay? Uh, all right, so just take this for a fact. I am not lying to you. I'm not lying to you. Well, now, on Friday, I checked out. She has nothing better to do than to play with me. <coughs> okay, but we need his help. So on Friday, we'll do, we're going to combine these two games. These were two winning games for her. And we're going to combine them by using a fair coin. We need one fair coin on the side. So we are playing the two of us, and he will be sitting there with a fair coin and tossing it. So he tosses and it comes out head. This is 50-50. If it is heads, we will play the Monday game with the rules of the Monday game, which are no rules at all. This is a very silly game, okay? If it comes out tails, we will play this game with its own rules, okay? We are starting, so the fortune is zero, therefore we have to use that coin. We toss, something happens, now he tosses again. Head or tail, 50% will decide. Eh? Some night he may have something better to do than playing with these two fools. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm the fool, you're not. So he won't come. In that case, we'll just make a rule that we'll just alternate. Eh? Play Monday, follow by Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday. I mean, we have gotten rid of him in some sense. 50-50, we're playing one game and the other game. And now you're willing to play. Remember, you beat me here and you beat me there. Well, by now I've told you too much already. And this is when the students start throwing stuff at me. Now I beat you. So you combine two winning games in a perfectly random fashion, perfectly fair fashion, because he's not biased. He just tosses this fair coin. And now your fortune will do something and then it will go down. So this is the point. 
that you can combine, I'm perfectly willing to, I mean, you're invited, I'm serious, invited to my little talk. The students will be very impressed if I manage to get anyone from here to camp. I'm, I'm proving the math of, the, I mean, this is not my own math. This is what people did. I mean, behind this, there was a very deep piece of physics in Parondo realizing that something that Feynman said was incorrect. Feynman, he would be the first one to laugh the fact that he was wrong. Feynman, in general, is, I'm not saying once again that if you combine any two winning strategies, you get a losing one. If that were true, we wouldn't be around. Okay? Common sense tells you that this shouldn't happen. Well, and all that I'm telling you, if you pick the parameters super carefully, sometimes you get shocked. And this is what happens here. So for this one, I think you should uh, <clears throat> look at the web under what is called Parondos, don't, don't bother with uh, Parondos paradox. And there are explanation Parondos paradox. This is what, what you should look for, okay? Uh, I want to, you told me 4 p.m. What? <laughs> Now, I want to, I, I need people to come close if, if you want to see this. So I, I need, you're tired of playing with me, so I need another volunteer here. I have a deck of cards. I mean, th this game is totally different. I mean, some of you, does anyone know, there is some, some game called Blackjack, huh? or 21? Back, in, you know that one, okay. Uh, there was a man, who, a mathematician, who wrote a book called Beat the Dealer. Edward Thorpe is a real person. Mm -hmm. And back in the 60s, early 60s, he wrote a book. He noticed that that game, if you count cards properly, uh, you can actually beat the dealer. Okay, so he wrote the book, and then the, the casinos did something. Uh, what they did first is they uh, changed the rules of the game so that people couldn't beat them, okay? Then people stopped playing the game. That's what they tell me, I, I, I wasn't there. So then they did something much cheaper. They hired two big guys in the door and they made sure that Thorpe wouldn't set foot in, in, in the casino. So that was, so the rules, if you go back to the casino now, the rules are as they were before, but they have made some few changes, okay? And 21, it's a movie that some of you may have seen, is, is based on that thing. So you all know that counting cards is a very important thing. So I want to show you some, another, the last way for you to lose your money. It has to do with counting. Uh, so I have a deck of cards here, black and, and, and red. And what we'll do is the following. We'll play the following game. I'm going to lay it down here. Somebody from the audience. My cousin was supposed to be here by now. You want to do it? You're not my cousin, so you can come in. Very good. Okay. So if, if you wanted to, I have, I have one more deck so we can try. So I, I have to explain before you mess up my strategy. I have to explain what we're going to do. If you wanted to come closer, you're more than welcome. Um, he will cut the deck more or less in half. It doesn't have to be exactly half, okay? and lay them one next to the other. Please do that. <laughs> Very good, okay. So, boy, he may have cut it just in the middle. What I'm going to, I don't know. Let me, let me do the following thing. Just, I'm going to count how many there are here. Eh? Two, you, you better watch. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Okay, almost, almost 26 and 26, okay? Now, there is one more thing that he will do. He will take these two halves, more or less halves, and shuffle them, just one single shuffle. Just that. Don't start doing it many times or anything. Just, eh? So I'll, I'll demonstrate without actually doing it. Okay. Look, I'm not, nothing. So you go brum like that, eh? Mm? <laughs> and and may, some people can do a perfect shuffle, some people cannot. You don't, you don't have to do it, you can do whatever you want. Do, do something. Mm? 
You have to watch his hands. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. I, I think, yeah, it's, this, is, this is the only applause you're going to get. So you <laughs> okay. So now, now uh, we will do the following thing. I will take, we will play, have you got enough money? Oh, we will play uh, the following game. I'll take them two at a time, and if they are of the same color, that is black and black, or red and red, uh, he wins. And then we keep doing that. If they are of different colors, I win. And we're always talking one dollar, let's say. Uh, are you willing? No, I have to ask. I mean, you told me that there are lawyers checking everywhere. Are you willing to play? <laughs> now I'll get another volunteer. Yeah, I'll play, I'll play, I'll play. Okay. So here we go. So you should be closer so you can see. The first one, I, I win. Okay. So that's not, not too bad. Second one. Oi, you better do something. What's going on? I told you they were not going to applaud you very soon. <laughs> man doesn't know how to shuffle, that's it. <laughs> you may spend all your time at school learning math instead of this. Well, pretty soon you should start doing something, no? Okay. So, we, we can go on. No, I have that much money. Well, you, you don't have enough money, I'll, I'll take credit cards, checks, anything you want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, uh, this is actually, uh, uh, you are having a very bad day, you must have, <laughs> were you sent here in punishment for misbehaving at school or something? Nobody told you that it was going to be this bad. <laughs> this is, okay. well, the truth is this is an optical illusion. The people from there are changing the colors, the cards, no, 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 no. just making that up. <laughs> and this is your last chance, but it doesn't work. How okay, were cards originally stacked? Were they all the reds and then all the blacks? Or were they next to the There must be a saying in some book saying, you tell the name of a sinner but not the sin, or, or the other way around, or whatever. <laughs> We can do that once more, but it's already, you, you tell me, can I go on or you start paying extra for the room? Okay. Well, somebody else wants to try this? Lost enough money. You lost enough money. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think you've seen, if somebody wants, I'll, wait, but we should stop on time probably, whatever you want, yeah. I have some few other ones. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll use, I'm not sure if I, well, the camera is going on, so I have to be careful. Um, okay, but I'll, I'll, I'll protect the guilty. Uh, I was invited once to give a talk at, at some bank in New York. I'm not going to mention the name of the bank, um, but it's a well-known bank. And this is just before the financial crisis. We're talking, I forget what, maybe 2000, some, something like that, and I was, explaining uh, this, this game here, and they were all very young and super uh, savvy, and before I put any details, any, any of the numbers, as I have not put them in here yet, uh, somebody jumped and said, oh, I understand everything and it's totally trivial. So I thought for a moment, what am I going to say? I said, look, I, I, I must have one, uh, thought for at least a minute. I ended up saying, look, you're all very bright, you're a very young man, and you're super smart, and I'm a very old guy, and nobody's paying me for this talk, and they are not going to invite me here again ever anyway, so let me tell you the truth. There is no way you can understand, because what I'm about to tell you depends crucially on how you pick these proportions, okay? This is my little comment about why Wall Street went the way it went. It went. Some people scare other people using mathematics. Certainly this case was an example of that. There are 
people that are so smart, they understand everything. Everything is in the details, and you have to do some really dirty work behind. Anyway, thank you very much for the chance to talk here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stop.